So I'm doing another one of these kind of big manga lectures that takes a whole week. So this is really a continuation of uh, last time. This is the outline for the whole week. We got to sort of through most of the stuff on face perception, though I'll do some more today. We're right there. Uh, and we're going to go on and consider this question of what's innate and how do you wire up brains? Okay. So first, a brief recap of main points from last time. Um, what, if anything, is innate about face perception? We considered lots of different kinds of evidence, behavioral and neural. And the bottom line is maybe not that much, right? So there's a few things that are sort of suggestive, like newborns have this bias to look at faces more than other non-face stimuli that are pretty similar, schematic faces versus scrambled schematic faces. And that's suggestive. But then there's the possibility that that's just due to some very, very simple property of those stimuli, namely just having more junk on the top than the bottom, like eyes on the top than the bottom, okay? So what would have to be innate in that case would be just the simplest possible template, not even a whole face. Similarly, we showed that there's actually very good discrimination of one face from another, even across viewpoint changes in newborn humans. Uh, and also in monkeys that were raised without ever uh, being allowed to see faces. Um, and both of those things suggest innate abilities uh, to process faces, but in both cases, it's possible to argue that that ability isn't due to face mechanisms in particular, it's due to just general vision and shape perception. Okay. Um, Third, I showed you beautiful recent data showing that the face patches in monkeys uh, don't develop if monkeys are reared without ever seeing faces, okay? Uh, which also suggests that maybe not that much is innate. So all that is fine, but then there's a big wide open question that's left unanswered by all of that, which is how do the face areas know uh, to land right there in everybody robustly? That really feels like something has to be an A, okay? About the brain, at least, to, to say where those things should go. Okay, so one possibility that I'm sort of skipping over because it's a whole little universe and there isn't an answer yet. People are working on it right now. People in this building are working on it right now. But the gist of the idea um, is, that, um, is that there may be, maybe what's innate is some other kind of simpler selectivity, maybe like selectivity for curved things. Remember how I talked about as you go up the visual system, you start with selectivity for spots of light and then edges. Well, maybe up there you're born with selectivity for curved things or something like that, that is face-like enough that somehow that leads face selectivity to land there later. It's kind of vague because nobody really knows, but that's, it. that's an idea. Another possibility that we'll talk more about in a moment is a possibility that the reason your face patches land right there is something about the long range structural connectivity of that region to the rest of the brain makes that the right place. Okay. Um, and so all of this is very actively being investigated and nobody knows the right answer here. Further, I just want to mention um, that deep net modeling is just very suddenly in the last year become a very powerful way to approach these same questions from a different angle. So um, with deep nets, you can ask, what do you need to build into a network to get it to produce face patches, right? So that's a way of asking kind of in principle in a network where you can actually control everything about its architecture and about the stimuli it sees, what are the necessary conditions for it to produce something like face patches? Uh, what, what do you have to train it on to get it to produce face patches and to be able to recognize faces? And at the top level, why computationally does it make sense to have face patches in the first place? This is kind of the biggest question lurking in the background of this whole field. I'm describing all of these specialized mechanisms in mind and brain, but really, wouldn't it be nice to know why our minds and brains are organized that way rather than just that they are? And that's a really hard question, and I think there's a real hope now that um, computational modeling may get us toward an answer sometime in the next decade. Maybe, maybe even the next few years. Okay, so that's the overview.